Hello and welcome to this first look exploring session, our first session looking at The Blind Beggar of Alexandria by George Chapman. We're sort of doing uh, a number of plays in the late 1590s, sort of backwards. We, 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 we started with a, a later play on, on humours and then we did a slightly earlier play on the comedy of the humours and then we got, we've gone backwards. Uh, to this one, which comes slightly before that. This is from a. Uh, this oh, was premiered on on a Thursday, <laughs> um, <laughs> Thursday the twelfth of February, fifteen ninety six. It took three quid, as far as Henslow was concerned. Uh, though by the end of the year, uh, that went down to three shillings. Uh, so it had a good run across uh, fifteen ninety six, um, and uh, seems to have uh, uh, and. Uh, Chapman additional commission uh, uh, coming up uh, the following year uh, for plays that we have already looked at. Um, but as I say, we've, we're going back to uh, the, the roots. We're going back to the beginning uh, of, of Chapman's uh, theatrical career with this play, which I say seems to have been moderately successful. 17 performances in, in, in the space of a year. Pretty good. Um, to discover how the play functions, think about what we might do with it today. Uh, by the nature of its title, it may be uh, moderately problematic in some uh, of its attitudes, but it may not. It may surprise us all. It is labelled as most pleasantly discoursing his variable humours in disguised shapes full of conceit and pleasure. And uh, it's uh, uh, Lord Admiral's men uh, play. Uh, as, uh, as as listed. So uh, that's all the background I'm going to give you, probably more than I should give you, uh, to discover how the play is going to function. Reading today, and boy, am I going to pronounce these wrong. Um, <coughs> not even on purpose, so it's just going to go horribly wrong. Reading, Iris, uh, account, uh, maybe Leon and Cleanthes today, but just to uh, not confuse you, they're all the same person, is... Aliki Chapel, uh, actor and translator based in the north of England. Uh, reading Pego and Second Lord today is... Hello, I'm Lynn Freitas. Uh, I am a college composition teacher. I'm about to go back to work. Uh, and uh, I live in the northwestern United States. Uh, reading uh, Elamine, First Lord and Doricles is... Hello, I'm Sarah Blake. I'm an actor, writer and director living in Germany. Uh, reading Samophis, uh, Aguile, and Polydor is. Oh no 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 no! I sorry I sp I sorry my 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 chart is completely wrong. Reading Samophis, uh, Ianthe, and Eurobates is Alexandra, and I will be mispronouncing things totally out of solidarity with Rob. <laughs> uh, reading Aguile and Polydor is. Hi, I'm Greg, and yeah, I'm somewhere near Stratford and Reading. <laughs> <laughs> Reading uh, Druso, Bregadino, and Ptolemy is. Hi, I'm Emma Kemp. Um, I'm an actor, and I'm in London. Uh, Reading Marcia, Herald, Jaqueen, uh, and Tisthenes is. Rachel, actor on the East Coast. And finally, reading Minipus and Clearchus is... Hello, I'm Helen Good. I'm a historian and I'm in Hull. Uh, other pronunciations are available and I'm sure will be tried out uh, as the text may give us clues actually how things should be pronounced based on uh, how lines scan and things like that. I'm your host Robert Christ and I'll be reading stage directions and stepping in where I have uh, made any errors in the casting. So without further ado let us dive into scene one. There are no act divisions for this text. Nobody's I think even bothered to add some later on. Uh, so scene one Enter Queen Aguile, uh, 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 Ianthe, her maid, and two counsellors. Leave me a while, my lords, and wait for me. At the black fountain by Osiris's grove, I'll walk alone to Hyoli Iris's cave, talking a little while with him, and then return. Ianthe, be gone. And uh, exit everybody else apart from Aguile. Iris, let thy mind eternal I extend the virtues of it past the sun. Ah, my clientes, where art thou become? Since I saved thy guiltless life from death and turned it only into banishment, forgive me, love me, 
pity comfort me. Enter Irus the beggar with Pego. Master. Pego. Wipe your eyes and you had them. Why, Pego? The queen is here to see your blindness. Her majesty is welcome. Heavens preserve and send her highness an immortal reign. Thanks, Reverend Tyrus, for thy gentle prayer. Dismiss thy man a while and I will lead thee for I have weighty secrets to impart. Would I were blind that she might lead me. And exit Pego. Iris, thy skill to tell the drifts of fate, our fortunes and things hid from sensual eyes have sent me to thee for advertisement. Where Duke Cleanthes lives, that was exiled this kingdom for attempting me with love and offering stain to Egypt's royal bed. I hope your majesty will pardon me if conscience makes me utter what I think of that high love affairs twixt him and you. I will, sweet Iris, being well assured that whatsoever thy sharp wisdom sees in my sad frailty, thou wilt have regard to my estate and name and keep it close. Of that your highness may be well assured. Then I am bound, madam, to tell you this, that you yourself did see Cleanthe's love, and to aspire it made away his duchess, which he well knowing, and affecting her dear as his life, denied to satisfy that kindness offered twixt yourself and him. Therefore did you in rage inform the duke he sought your love, and so he banished him. Too true it is, grave Iris, thou hast told. But for my love's sake, which not gods can rule, strive me no more of that wound yet too green. But only tell me where Cleanthes is that I may follow him in some disguise and make him recompense for all his wrong. Cleanthes is about this city oft, with whom your majesty shall meet ere long, and speak with him, if you will use such means as you may use for his discovery. What shall I then, sorry, what shall I use then, with what is in my power, I will not use for his discovery. I'll bind the wings of love onto mine arms, and like an eagle prying for her prey, will overlook the earth's round face for him. Were this sufficient? Or I will more like learn to swim and dive into the bottom of the sea for him. Lest being the son of Egypt and now set that is in rage with love would ravish him. <coughs> Were this sufficient? But madam, this must be the likeliest mean to seek him out and have him at your will. Let his true picture through your land be sent, opposing great rewards to him that finds him, and threaten death to them that succour him. So I'll assure your grace shall meet with him ere long. Happy and blessed be Iris for his skill, his sweetly plaints in my contentious mind, for which, most reverent and religious man, I give you this jewel to the richly worth a kentle or a hundred weight of gold. Bestow it as thou list on some good work, for I, well I know thou nothing dost reserve of all thy riches men bestow on thee. But wouldst thou leave this place and poor man's life, the court of Egypt should embrace thy feet and topless honours be bestowed on thee. I thank your highness for thus raising me, but in this barrenness I am most renowned for wisdom, and the sight of heavenly things shines not so clear as earthly vanities. Most rich is Iris in his poverty. Oh, that to find his skill my crown were lost. None but poor Iris can of riches boast. Now, my Cleanthes, I will straightly advance thy lovely pictures on each monument about the city and within the land. Propose you try 5,000 crowns to him that finds him to be tended by my hands and find a... <coughs> A fight, kind kiss at my imperial lips to him that succors him. I'll threaten death, but he that does not succor him shall die. For who is worthy life will see him once, see all his pictures when they be dispersed. Uh, will I continue on pilgrimages, make us to the saints and idols I adore? Well, I will offer sighs 
vows and tears and sacrifices a hecticon of beasts on several altars built where they are placed. By them shall Isis' statue gently stand, and I'll pretend my jealous rights to her. But my cliente shall the object be, and I will nail, kneel and pray to none but he. And exit the queen. See, earth and heaven, where her Cleanthes is, I am Cleanthes, and blind Iris, too. No, and more than these, as you shall soon perceive. Yet, but a shepherd's son at Memphis born. I will tell you how I got that name. My father was a fortune teller, and from him I learnt his art. And knowing to grow great was to grow rich. Such money as I got by palmistry I put to use, and by that means became to take the shape of Leon, by which name I am well known a wealthy usurer. And more than this, I am two noblemen, Count Hermes is another of my names, and Duke Cleanthes, whom the Queen so loves. For till the time that I may claim the crown, I mean to spend my time in sports of love, which in the sequel you shall plainly see, and joy, I hope, in this my policy. Ta-da! Um, hi, um, here's the plot. Um... <laughs> And it's one hell of an info burst there. I mean, it's like um, <laughs> we, 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 we start with, oh, where is such and such? Our uh, blind person tell us that the, what, what will happen and go to it. And the audience presumably is, is not intended to know yet. But this is this guy's everybody. Uh, but then <laughs> then he, he it's not just he says, ah, I am such and such disguised as such and such. No, no. Uh, I've got a whole, I've got a whole series of fake identities that I've, I've got to let, let, look all available um, <laughs> to dip into. Um, uh, yeah, it's just giving, giving us all that information straight away and just saying, right, this is the game. This is the game this player is going to play. Uh, thoughts from the room uh, about this, uh, this exchange, <laughs> this opening uh, about what's going on. Um, uh, Alexandra, you're you're thinking about waving. You're thinking yes, about it. Yes, that's that's what I I'm I'm confused as mm. to because the the there's that moment of exchange between um, the two of them where Igali has just said something about being pursued by by Cleanthes. Um, uh, yes. He was exiled this kingdom for attempting me to love. And Iris goes, um, I think you'll find it's the <laughs> other way around. <laughs> so, yes, it's already setting up this this sort of um, whom are we supposed to trust? And then, of course, Iris later on, um, as soon as she's gone, tells us that he is quite a shady and untrustworthy character. Um, but uh, but yes, I feel like it may be my reading. I, I don't think she denies his correction. Um, so yeah, I'm just confused in life in general, but especially right now. Also, I wanted to say for the purpose of unconfusing the audience, um, I think that might be one of the reasons why it's a good thing that Iris says, I will be known by all these names. It's still me, by the way, audience, because there are so many other names in this play that the audience would have to keep track of. So I think that might be rather than an error. I think that might actually be a very useful intentional decision. Oh yes, no, I, 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 I think that's that's fair. Uh, Lynn, you were waving earlier. Then uh, Aliki, then Sarah. Yes. So, I, 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 I think as as Alexander said that 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 the Queen doesn't correct him when he says, "Oh no, no, no." What happened was you fell in love with Cleanthes, and you made away his Duchess. Basically, you had her assassinated. So here we have this thing. It's supposed to be a pleasant, you know, it's so entertaining. It's so fun. And the and the story is set up with a murderer, a murderer in the backstory. I, so that's just a little weird. Hmm. <laughs> you know uh, what I mean? <laughs> uh, Aliki. Yeah, I'm just wondering how many other, uh, how many people in the company are double cast as characters, because that would be really confusing. It's like, well, no, when he is dressed differently, he really is a different person. But that guy, he's always the same. Mm. Yeah. Um, and actually, there's, there's an interesting question about how double this is, uh, which we might go into later. Uh, Sarah. 
Yes, I was going to make the same point as Aliki about the doubling. And in addition to that, also, this playwright is 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 taking a big risk here because he, he's he's told us all right at the beginning of the play all the different characters that this guy is, and what is the betting that that you that the audience are going to remember them, like like <laughs> okay he's he's a, he's Eros and he's and he's Cleanthes and he was another one. Was he? What? What was the other one? Oh, Leon. and then there was, and then there was another one after that. Yeah. I mean, someone's going to appear <laughs> as as a count or a somebody every time a new person's going to come on stage. She's like, oh, is he? Is he meant to be someone else? What? No. Uh, and especially if there's doubling with uh, in, in the rest of the class as well, I could just see this going horribly wrong. <laughs> Uh, Not for the actors on stage, but for the audience watching, like having like some internal fight with themselves about who is who and what what's happening. I I I suspect whoever's playing Eris, well, their their principal job every time they come on is go. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, flips the wig up. Um, <laughs> Helen. Yeah, I was thinking that there must be some highly identical characteristic that the rest of the cast can ignore, but the audience <laughs> always yeah. recognises. Yeah. You know, something like bright red hair or something oh, that I... goes from, I mean, that that's silly, but something that goes from character to character that the audience will always clock on to, that the rest of the, everybody else can conveniently pretend not to see. Mm. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, we've uh, we're, we're still mid scene. Uh, lots of stuff is uh, sort of going on. Um, there's uh, I I do love the way the queen sort of uh, just before the exits going. Oh my love, I will now build uh, a monument with your face and standing and going. Well, you're, you're not doing very good at recognizing what he looks like, are you? <laughs> um, you know, literally talking about his, his his face standing. I mean, the audience. It, nobody knows this is an irony. This is this is the weird thing about that bit, moment. Is we don't know it's an irony yet. Um, it's, so it's an a, irony. Hmm. But, yeah. Well, well, effectively, it isn't because she doesn't know. Nobody knows it is. <laughs> oh, if the speech but, followed oh. uh, Iris's uh, opening uh, remarks, then it would be uh, Helen. So the Queen has murdered the blind beggar's wife. It sounds that way. Now that's bad. It's not a good thing. That's not something that you cast, that you brush I mean, off. Unless she had her done away with in some other way, spirited off into exile or something. Or, 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 or else she thought she'd killed her, but actually the blind beggar being on top of things didn't let it happen. And she's now living in a cupboard somewhere. Under the stairs. Yeah. Let's see if there's let's see if there's more data on this. Uh or uh and see where we go. Uh so Iris is still on stage having chatted to the audience about his cunning plan, which is very cunning. And then we are in stage invasion of Enter uh Pego Elamine, Samophis, and Marsha with their men, Menippus, Polydor, and Druso. Oh, master, here come the three wenches. Now strike it dead for a fortune. These are the nymphs of Alexandria, so-called because their beauties are so rare. With two of them at once am I in love, deeply and equally. The third of them, my silly brother here as much affects, whom I have made the burgomaster of this rich town, with the great wealth I have bestowed on him. All three are maids kept passing warily, yet lately being at their father's house, as I was Leon, the rich usurer, I fell in love with them. They're my brother, too. This fitly chanceth that they have liberty to visit me alone. Now will I tell their fortunes, so as may make way to both their loves at once. The one, as I am Leon, the rich usurer, the other, as I am the mad brain count. <laughs> and do the best, too, for my brother's love. Thanks, good master brother. But what are they that talk with them so long? Are they wooers, Trowel? I do not like it. Would they would come near? Oh, those are three servants that attend on them. Let them alone. Let them talk a while. Tell us, Menippus, Druso, and Polydor, why all our parents gave you three such charge to wait on us and oversee us still. 
What do they fear, thank you, that we would do? <laughs> fear is lest you should accompany such as love wanton talk and dalliance. Why? What is wanton talk? Uh, to tell you that were to offend ourselves and those that have forbidden you should hear it. Why? What is dalliance, says my servant then? You must not know because you must not dally. <gasps> How say you by that? Well, do you keep it from us as much as you can? We'll desire it nevertheless, I can tell you. Lord, which trade keepers of poor mates are you? You are so chaste, you are the worse again. Be you good servants. Will you do us the service to leave us alone a while? We are commanded not to be from you, and therefore to leave you alone were to wrong the trust your parents put in us. I cry you mercy, sir, yet do not stand all on the trust our parents put in you. But put us in a little too, I pray. Trust us, good servant, by ourselves a while. Yes, my masters, and you say the word. They'll but to Iris for to know their fortunes, and he's a holy man, all Egypt knows. Stay not too long then, mistress, and content. That's my good servant. We will straight return. And you, mistress? And I, trusty servant. Okay, then I'll venture my charge among the rest. And exit the serving men. A mighty venture. You shall be chronicled in Abraham's ass's catalogue of coxcombs for your resolution. Now the great fool take them all. Who could have picked out three such lifeless puppies? Never to venture on their mistresses. One may see by them it is not meat choice men. It is not meat Choice men should have offices. Pretty moral. Work it in the sampler of your heart. But are we by ourselves? I think so, unless you have a bone in your belly. Not I, God knows. I never came where they grew yet. Since we are alone, let us talk a little merrily. Methinks I long to know what wanton talk and dalliance is lay my life tis that my mother uses when she and others do begin to talk and that she says to me maid get your hands you fall to your needle what a maid and idle a maid and idle why maids must be idle but not another thing then do not name it for i fear it is not for yesterday I heard Menippus as he was talking with my mother's maid, and I stood hearkening at the chamber door, said that with that word a maid was got with child. <gasps> How? With the very word? I mean, with that the word seems to express. Nay, if you be so fine, you will not name it now we are all alone. You are much too nice. Why, let her choose. Let us two name it. Do then, Elamine. Nay, do you, Marsha? Why, woman, I dare. Do then, I warrant thee. I'll warrant myself if I list. But come, let it alone. Let us to Iris for our fortunes. God save grave Iris. Welcome, beauteous nymphs. Uh, how know you, Iris? We are beautiful and cannot see. Homer was blind, yet could he best discern the shapes of everything, and so may I. Indeed, we hear your skill can beautify beauty itself, and teach dames how to deck their heads and bodies fittest to their forms, to their complexions, and their countenances. So can I, beauteous nymphs, and make all eyes sparkle with love fire from your excellence. How think you we are tired to tempt men's looks, being thus nymph-like? Is it not too strange? It is the better, so it doth become. But that I may disclose to you your fortunes, tell me first, Hago, their true faces forms. And before uh, before we get to any description of what's going on, I think we should just... Uh, 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 just uh... 
before we get too deep into what what Iris's responses are, um, yeah, this is what happens when you don't have properly organised sex education. Uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean. These, these, these are, um, yeah. They, they really want to know what, what's, what's going on. Uh, the servants aren't up to anything. They're, they're, they're very good at all getting rid of their, 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 their parents. Uh, uh, the, the guardians, their parents have, have put on this school trip. Um, but, uh, yeah, they're, um, they, yeah. There's, there's, there's some. Um, I, I feel like this is now doing this. This whole thing is going to do some sort of important public service to anyone in the audience now. I, 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 I don't, I don't know where this is going. It's um, yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, thoughts from the room about the uh, the these uh, these three ladies. Uh, it, I, I like the way that Iris just basically goes, aha, some some uh, uh, stage business has entered. Uh, let's stand to one side and let them do their thing until we're needed again. Um. I've got a water bottle somewhere just to, you know, have a drink while they're doing that. Um, it's very demarcated. Um, uh, Alexandra, then Lynn. Um, just a very quick one. I like that they don't seem... They're not written to seem stupid. Mm. They're written to seem innocent of this one thing. So, for example, the minute that Iris arrives and calls them beauteous, the, one of them goes, wait, 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 hang on a second. Um, so, you know, they're not um, they're not clueless as to how the world works. They ju There's just this one area that they're completely or mostly um, innocent in. Mm. Because you know they've got a very strong handle on the the servant situation, you know, they, and you know they 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 are very clued into their world. Uh, it's just they they are lacking de data and uh, other elements. Yeah, uh, Lynn, then Aliki, uh, you're muted at the moment, Lynn. So back to the beginning of the seat. Maybe it's just because I'm playing Pego. I I think it's a little odd that in um, the first sort of sequence, Eris reveals to us that he's a master of disguise and his father was a magician and blah, blah, I'm going to do all this stuff. But he waits until now to say, oh, by the way, my servant, he's actually my brother. Um, and there's these three women and I'm in love with two of them and he's in love with one of them and I'm going to fix it so we all get some ha ha ha. Uh, so it's just a little weird that he didn't reveal that relationship in his first monologue like oh well okay but it's just weird yeah it, it does have a certain i mean we were talking about tone and uh, question of tone late uh, earlier about you know are people dying already uh, or have people died historically um but this does feel very to you know to the audience and you know it feels very broad uh this this stuff um that he's doing here but i could be wrong about that um aliki there's something quite titillating about this uh, three young maidens who don't know what sex is thing. Uh, and I think it's... It, I'm also curious about wh what Marsha means by unless you have a bone in your belly. I know what we all think that it means, but if they're that innocent, well, what does it mean? <laughs> mm. Something she's heard. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That makes uh. sense. Yeah, and, so they're and we... really. I mean, it, it's not an inaccurate portrayal of maidenly innocence, really. There's a great deal of terrible curiosity when you don't know what's going on. Mm. Well, it's this idea oh. that there's a word, there's a word, and it, it, yeah, and it's just yeah. you hear yeah. the word. What's the word? Well, I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> uh, Lynn. I mean, you can you can understand that pregnancy happens. That women have have. They get big, and then they, they, they grow a baby, and then the baby—I mean, the bone in the belly is a is is an unborn child, but not have any idea exactly how that happens. It involves yeah. men, but we don't really know exactly what that looks like. <laughs> okay, shall we gather more data on 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 these uh, these people trying to gather data? Um, so. Um, uh it we've um we've had that question uh asked to uh to pego um about uh, their true faces forms because of course he's pretending to be the blind beggar so uh pego uh what what do they look like 
Marry, sir, this that speaks to you has a face thin like unto water gruel, and yet it would do your heart good if you could see it. I know, and see it better than thyself, the blaze whereof doth turn me to a fire, burning mine entrails with a strong desire. Why turnst thou from us, Iris? Tell my fortune. I wonder at the glory it presents to my soul's health that sees upon your head a coronet, and at your gracious feet nobles and princes in their highest state. <laughs> State shall crown your fortune ere you die, and ere the heart of heaven, the glorious sun, shall quench his roseate fires within the west. You shall a husband have, noble and rich. Happy Elimine, oh, that I might too. Thanks for this good news, good Iris. But disclose the means to this, if it be possible. When you come home, ascend your father's tower. If you see a man come walking by and looking up to you, descend and issue, for you shall have leave. And if he woo you, choose him from the world, though he seem humorous and want an eye wearing a velvet patch upon the same, choose him your husband and be blessed in him. I'll do as thou advisest, gentle Iris, and proving this, I'll love thee whilst I live. My fortune now, sweet Iris. What face hath this nymph, Pego? Marry, sir, a face made in form like the ace of hearts. And well compared, for she commands all hearts, equal in beauty with that other nymph, and equally she burns my heart with love. You see? Say, sweet Iris, what my fortune is. Thou turnst from me and when, as when thou didst admire the happy fortune of Illumine. So might I well, admiring yours no less, than when the light-crowned monarch of the heavens shall quench his fire within the ocean's breast. Rise you and to your father's garden high, there in an arbour do a banquet set. And if there come a man that of himself sits down and bids you welcome to your feast, accept him. For he is the richest man that Alexandria or Egypt hath, and soon possessing him with all his wealth, in little time you shall be rid of him, making your second choice amongst mighty kings. Blessed be thy lips, sweet Iris, and that light that guides thy bosom with such deep foresight. Sleep shall not make a closet for these eyes, all this succeeding, night for haste to rise. My fortune now, sweet Iris, but a faith, I have some wrong to be the last of all, for I am old as they, and big enough to bear as great a fortune as the best of them. What face hath this nymph, Pego? Oh, master, what face, what face hath she not? If I could beg a face, I would have her face. But is it round, and hath it ne'er a blemish, a mouth too wide, a look too impudent? Oh, master, tis without all these, and without all cry. Round faces and thin-skinned are happiest still. And unto you, fair nymph, shall fortune be exceeding gracious too. When the next morning, therefore, you shall rise, put in your bosom rosemary, thyme, and rue, and presently stand at your father's door. He that shall come offering kindness there, and crave for favour, those same wholesome herbs bestow them on him. And if meeting him, he keep the nuptial rosemary and thyme, and tread the bitter rue beneath his feet, choose him your husband and be blessed in him. I win, sweet Iris. Nothing grieves me now but that Elamine this night shall have her happy husband, and I stay till morning. Naught grieves me, Iris, but that we are maids kept short of all things, and have naught to give thee. But take our loves, and in the wished proof of these high fortunes thou foretellest us, nothing we have shall be too dear for thee. We that are sisters, Iris, by our vow, will be of one self-blood. 
good and thankful mind to a door so clear a sight in one so blind. And exit the maids. Farewell, most beauteous nymphs, your loves to me shall more than gold or any treasure be. Now, to my wardrobe for my velvet gown, now doth the sport begin. Come, gird this pistol closely to my side, by which I make men fear my humour still, and have slain two or three, as for my mood, when I have done it most advisedly to rid them as they were my heavy foes. Now <clears throat> I am known to be the mad brain count, whose humours twice five summers I have held, and said at first I came from stately Rome, calling myself Count Hermes, and assuming the humour of a wild and frantic man, careless of what I say or what I do. And so such faults, as I of purpose do, is buried in my humour. And this gown I wear in rain or snow or in the hottest summer, and never go nor ride without a gown which humour does not fit my frenzy well, but hides my person's form from being known when I Cleanthes am to be descried. And here he disguises himself as Count Hermes, enter Pego like a burgomaster. Well, how now, master brother? Oh, sir, you are very well suited. Now, master burgomaster, I pray you remember to seize on all Antisthenes his goods, his lands and chattels, to my proper use, as I am Leon the rich usurer, the sun is down, and all is forfeited. It shall be done, my noble count. And withal, sir, I pray you forget not your love tomorrow <clears throat> morning at her father's door. Ah, my good count, I cannot that forget, for still to keep my memory in order, as I am burgomaster, so love is my recorder. And they exit. So I don't think there's going to be any problem knowing who uh, Iris is at any moment, because it like it looks like it's going to be, I'm going to show you the transformation now, here's, here's the things, and here's the stuff, and here, this is my new persona. I don't know whether he's going to pop in and out as different people in in a in a confusing way uh but it, so far it doesn't look like that that's where that's going uh a leaky uh, and then lynn are you waving or is your just no, hand? No, no your hand is just there oh, lynn my hand is just there yeah so yeah rob i was i was thinking the same thing now that's a good solution to um when is it actual doubling so there are different people within the world of the play and when is it disguising having Eris disguise himself on stage is a great solution for that. And, and if his disguises are persuasive and the audience gets to see that transformation, that sort of adds to the fun, doesn't it? Um, although as as an old costume designer, my, my first impulse was something like Helen's. He needs to have one thing about him, about his person that always stays the same that the audience can, um, can make that connection. I was thinking like a piece of jewelry or something like that, but maybe he has like bright red shoes. He always has the red shoes on. Uh, is that he doesn't he doesn't change that when he changes on stage. So the and and if the, his uh, interlocutors in the play never look down, that might be persuasive enough that we can we can identify him by this one article of clothing that never comes off, but they never notice. Something like that. But I love the on stage change. I think that's hilarious and clever. Uh, Alexandra. I have a little build on that. Um, in the chat, I was putting in, you know, highly recognizable actor in totally impenetrable um, costume. Um, but come to think of it, um, you know, rather than Christopher Reeve in glasses, is it possible, do we know enough or is it possible to find out enough about um, the company and who would have played this? Because I know that there were very famous comedy actors in previous generations, the people like like Tarleton, that everybody in the audience would have known that's him. So it doesn't matter if he's changing disguises. As long as he's told us that's in character, we're always going to recognize that face. Um, so, the, yes, that's that's my query is would it, would it be possible to know whether this might actually be leaning on that on a highly recognizable face probably um there may be some data on that but i, I don't have it hand uh, okay. I, I, uh but uh it's it, it's uh, we are moving into the territory where we increasingly know the, the who the the actual actors would would have been or at least have a reasonable idea of who they probably would have been 
Um, you know, this is this is a time when the admiral's men are not leaning heavily on their Alain, uh, as it were, because he's uh, he's retired for the first time around about now. So there's an interesting question about what the the company is trying to do without their big star bombastic actor um, and the kind of plays that they might be producing at this thing uh, at this time. Um, but yeah, we've got, had this continuation, this this continuation of the scene with the uh, the, the the three uh, uh, maidens, um, each asking for for uh, some sort of prophecy in turn. Um, it, it's it's throwing up all sorts of interesting things about. Uh, well, it's an interesting question of tone as well about you know, is Iris being mocking with what he's saying, or is he is he playing to the expectations of the time? Um, it's all these questions of what uh, what people considered to be attractive at the time, and and how that is playing, and and what uh, which of those things are being said to them, and which are not being said to them, um, and 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 there's a lot of interplay about how all that functions that I'm finding really interesting. Um, you know, obviously he says the things they want them they want to hear. Uh, one of them's at least very excited, going, "I'm not going to sleep tonight. I'm just too, it's, you know, I'm not going to sleep till." Uh, this um uh, and yeah and they can't pay they, they don't have any pocket money so they can't pay pay him anything they can only pay him with love uh yeah thoughts uh any 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 thoughts arising out of that aliki then sarah then oh no aliki then rachel then sarah i mean we're talking about seducing innocent young women here and ruining them forever let's just put it that this this is a time in which they will be cast out and possibly killed for things like that so Nice man. Mm. Uh, Rachel. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, th I think he's, yeah, you've said it. He's, I, I think like if you staged it, you could do him like reading their tarot cards and saying this over like that or something. Um, yeah. It's kind of like what Aliki just said. Uh, and he, I, he's doing it openly under that, um, you know, thinly veiled guys. Uh -huh. mm, yes, because even before he's disguised, this kind of thing is performative, and this is the kind of thing you expect to hear from 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 uh, 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 someone who's doing this kind of predictive stuff. Uh, Sarah, uh, muted at the moment. Yes, yeah, small plot point. Um, when he was giving Samfil her fortune. He says, except him for he is the richest man that Alexandria or Egypt hath. So that presumably is going to be lay on the the the, the usurer. That that's going to be the the guy he goes to her. He'll be the count to um, whoever it is I'm playing, and um, and then the usurer to her. And then he says, and soon possessing him with all his wealth, in little time you shall be rid of him, making your second choice amongst mighty kings. So I'm wondering if he's going to marry her um bestow money on her and then actually like kill off his character kill off the character of leon so that she is then free to to take the money and then and and and, and make a different marriage in which case he's still a bastard but it does kind of i mean basically he wants he wants to kind of he wants to you know bed her but then the, he it's there's potential that he's making some sort of provision for her there yeah but the mighty king might be himself he's remember he's got that that that, that is, he, is he a king as well i thought he, he was a, it, it, it a might be part of the of... plot here um you know oh the, the, right so then there might the, the, that that's that's why i'm i'm not so sure about is that question of how seriously do we take what these predictions are meaning or right. where they're going um and also where where he his different personas will be further down the line yes uh, alexandra sorry yes because um at, in the first scene as the duke he's wooing a queen he well he's talking to the queen about the mutual oh, wooing between yes. her and the duke yeah. so um i'm now starting to doubt all the people that we've been saying he's killed um and mm. whether they're just for pre previous aliases yeah. or you know imaginary people that he's created this incredibly um elaborate multi-character spanish prisoner setup that he might have arranged um 
uh, also, I just wanted to point out, um, having read some office and completely messed up that line, the sleep shall not make a closet for these eyes all this succeeding night for haste to rise, right? I'm not going to sleep a wink because I'll be so excited to get up and marry this rich dude that I can then kill or get rid of in order to... <laughs> like, the fact that... that I, I don't know about the others, but she seems to be very, very... Um, openly excited about some about doing some terrible things without ever kind of considering her conscience. Yeah, it's... as if having one. Yeah, you know that's 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 the advantage that youth have. Uh, you know, the, 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 you don't need to worry about consequences. I mean, you know, they they don't even know. They, they, we we know they don't get given any money. They 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 clearly haven't been trusted with any kind of level of responsibility or, or, or yet. So, uh, you know, th these are all hypotheticals. Though. But conscience that we've met four people, we've met six people so far, and none of them seem to have a conscience. Yeah, but again, how seriously are they taking these predictions? You know, if it's in jest, um, then they, they, you know, it's it's not like we don't know yet whether they're actually planning on on on, on following through with any of this yet. Uh, Helen. Yes, a young man, a young woman marrying an old rich man would have a good expectation of becoming a young rich widow yeah it it which it was a highly desirable um, thing to be yeah so i don't think it's necessarily implied that that she creates her own widowhood it's just that she marries this one guy he's really rich he I died <laughs> uh and then she marries a king so but she's still looking forward to being a widow like <laughs> it's a little weird yeah. Uh, well, let's gather more more data yeah. about what this player is doing, uh, and uh, as we uh, we go to scene two, yes. Uh, so we uh, yes we we have a, re a return uh, of uh, El Elamine Elamine above on the walls. Now, see a morning in an evening rise, the morning of my love and of my joy. I will not say of beauty, that were pride. Within this tower, I would I had a torch to light like hero, my Leander hither. Who shall be my Leander? Let me see, rehearse my fortune. When you see one clad in a velvet gown and a black patch upon his eye, a patch, patch that I am, why? That may be a patch of cloth, of buckram or a fustian cloth, say with a velvet patch upon his eye, and so my thoughts may patch up love the better. <gasps> See where he comes! The Count! <gasps> what girl? A Countess? <laughs> uh, enter Iris disguised as Count Hermes. See! See! He looks as Iris said he should! <gasps> Go not away, my love! I'll meet thee straight. And she exits, presumably to go downstairs. Oh, I thank you. I am much beholding to you. I, I saw her in the tower, and now she has come down. Luck to this patch and to this velvet gown. Enter Elamine and uh, Bragadino, a Spaniard, following her. How now? Shall I be troubled with this rude Spaniard now? One word, sweet nymph. How now, sirrah? What are you? I am Signor Bragadino, the Marshal Spaniard, the aid of Egypt in her present wars. But, Jesu, what art thou that hast the guts of thy brains gripe with such famine of knowledge not to know me? How now, sir? I'll try the proof of your guts with my pistol, if you be so saucy, sir. Oh, I know him well. It is the rude count, the uncivil count, the unstayed count, the bloody count, the count of all counts. Better I were to hazard the dissolution of my brave soul against an host of giants than with this loose count. Otherwise, I could tickle the count. If faith, my noble count, I do descend to the craving of pardon. Love blinded me. I knew thee not. No, sir, you are but Bonaventura, not right spanish i perceive but do you hear sir are you in love surely the sudden glance of this lady nymph hath 
suppled my Spanish disposition with love that never before dreamt of a woman's concavity. A woman's concavity? Blood, what's that? Her hollow disposition, which you see sweet nature will supply, or otherwise stop up in her with solid or firm faith. Give me thy hand, we are lovers both. Shall we have her both? No, oh, good sweet count, pardon me. Why then, thus it shall be. We'll strike up a drum, set up a tent, call people together, put crowns apiece. Let's rifle for her. And all that, my honest count. Why, then, thus it shall be. We'll woo her both, and him she likes best shall lead her home through streets, holding by both her hands with his face towards her. The other shall follow with his back towards her, biting of his thumbs. How sayest thou by this? It is ridiculous, but I am pleased. For upon my life I do not know this. The shame will light on the neck of the count. Well, to it. Let's hear thee. Sweet nymph, a Spaniard is compared to the great elixir, or golden medicine. What, dost thou come upon her with medicines? Dost thou think she is sore? Nay, by thy sweet favour, do not interrupt me. Well, sir, go forward. I say a Spaniard is like the philosopher's stone. And I say another man's stone may be as good as a philosopher's at all times. By, the, by thy sweet favour. Go on. Well, sir, go on. Sweet nymph, I love few words. You know my intent. My humour is insophistical and plain. I am a Spaniard born. My birth speaks for my nature, my nature for your grace. And should you see a whole battle ranged by my skill, you would commit your whole self to my affection. And so, sweet nymph, I kiss your hand. To see a whole battle? <laughs> what a jest is that? Thou shalt see a whole battle come forth presently of me. Sa! 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 And draws his pistol. Put up thy pistol. Tis a most dangerous humour in thee. Oh, is that all? Why, see, tis up again. Now thou shalt see I'll come to her in thy humour. Sweet lady, I love sweet words, but sweet deeds are the noble sounds of a noble Spaniard. Noble by country, noble by valour, noble by birth. My very foot is nobler than the head of another man. Upon my life I love, and upon my love I live. And so, sweet nymph, I kiss your hand. Why, lo, here we are both, I am in this hand, and he is in that, handy dandy, prickly prandy, which hand will you have? This hand, my lord, if I may have my choice. Come, Spaniard, to your penance, bite your thumbs. Oh, base woman! Splod, no base woman, but bite your thumbs quickly. Honour commands, I must do it. Come on, sweet lady, give me your hands. If you are mine, I am yours. If you take me now at the worst, I am the more beholding to you. If I be not good enough, I'll mend. What would you more? It is enough, my lord, and I am yours, since I well know my fortune is to have you. Now must I leave the pleasant maiden chase in hunting savage beasts with Isis nymphs, and take me to a life which I... God knows, do no more, do no no more than how to scale the heavens. Well, I'll teach you, fear you not. What, Signor? Not bite your thumbs? Pardon me, sir, pardon me. By God's blood, I will not pardon you, therefore bite your thumbs. By thy sweet, let me speak one word with thee. I do not like this humour in thee, in pistoling men in this sort. It is the most dangerous and stigmatical humour, for, by thy favour, tis the most finest thing of the world for a man to have a most gentlemanlike carriage of himself. For otherwise, I do hold thee for the most tall, resolute, and accomplished gentleman on the face of the earth. Hark ye, we'll meet at Caracas, and we'll have a pipe of tobacco. Adieu, adieu. Do you hear, sir? Put your thumbs in your mouth without any more ado, and by the heavens I'll shoot thee through the mouth! 
It is base and ridiculous. Well, thou shalt do not do it. Lend me thy thumbs, I'll bite them for thee. Pardon me. Swoons, and ye had I would have made such a woeful parting betwixt your fingers and your thumb that your Spanish fists should never meet again in this world. Will you do it, sir? I will. I will, presto, and I will follow thee. Why, so? Oh, that we had a noise of musicians to play to this antic as we go. Come on, sweet lady, give me your hands. We'll to church and be married straight. Bear with my haste now. I'll be slow enough another time, I warrant you. Come, Spagnolo, questo, questo, Spagnolo, questo. And they exit. Uh, so, uh, yes, we've got lots of people talking about their humours. Um, we've uh, the, the wooing that was mentioned earlier and prophesied as, uh, has indeed occurred, um, uh, has been set up. And, uh, and yet we then have a, a, a rival wooer turning up at the same time. Don't you just hate it? You wait for one wooer to turn up and then several turn up at the same time. Um, and yeah, there's competition. Um, and uh, a lengthy use of the word count. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, the count later on, uh, perhaps uh, it, it being a bit of a count uh, later on um, by playing the game of just interrupting us all the time. As you're going, no, after you, no, no, I won't say anything. No, I, I oh yeah, ah, uh, mm. yeah, and you can imagine that could be played. Uh, actually, even more than the text even suggests. I mean, I'm sure he could just, you know, <coughs> yeah, Ooh. Um, at random moments. Uh, thoughts on the room? Uh, I saw lots of hands. I'll go to Rachel first. What is this thumb biting business? What does this all mean? I don't understand. Well, it's yeah, I, I I'm I'm not quite sure how it's functioning here. It seems to be more just stuff something in your mouth kind of thing, isn't it? That, that you can't talk. I'm not sure it's I'm not sure it's 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 uh, about going around insulting people, uh, which it can be a gesture of insult. But I don't think that's what it's doing here. I think it's more you—you you, you don't get to speak. You have to oh, kind of thing. I don't know. I could be wrong there. I'm—I'm I'm just throwing things out. Alexandra, thought. Just offering a counter theory to that. If biting of the thumb is indicated as an insult and a dare uh, to fight, which is the only other context I can think of uh, it being used as, the fact that he's a braggart, that the the Spanish uh, um, braggadocio kind of uh, um, character really, really doesn't want to, and he's finding any excuse, you know, to not be the initiator of the challenge because then he'd actually have to fight and prove the fact that he's a coward, which is the essence of that character stereotype um maybe that's what's what's happening is he's um uh, whoever he's playing the count i was gonna say what's what's his actual name um maybe that's what he's trying to do is is push the braggart towards proving his braggardiness it's it's it, it it's it's the way the count you know because he, he makes this this uh this thing about you know the the one who woos her uh, likes best shall lead her through the uh through uh, thorough streets holding her by both hands whereas the other one has to bite bite his thumbs so it's um it it's it's you don't get to hold hands uh, Helen and, and walk backwards mm. biting his thumbs yeah I mean looking like a fool effectively. Yeah. It's a sort of absurdist thing. I like that. Um, uh, other thoughts? Uh, Rachel, uh, we'll go back to you. Maybe to the last thing that was just said, the walking backwards with your thumb and thumbs in your mouth. If it's that challenge of fighting, maybe it's like walking out of a room with your middle fingers up. It's a very, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, and of course, I was said at the beginning you know we've we've been looking at other humors later plays which are really very into humors um whereas this play is bringing them up quite a lot uh, uh about the nature of character and it's uh, it's throwing it in there so uh, this this is a bit of a precursor to the uh, the expanding humor genre that we're going to be getting uh that we've already looked at um further on so uh, this this does prefigure that in in various ways so you can almost see what Chapman's sort of thinking ahead now to maybe the next thing where humours plays more of a part and Ben Johnson then expands that further. 
uh, as a more active part here. There's a lot of game playing. It's like we've got a scene of um, our, our, with with characters predicting what's going to happen next, and each has to do their prediction in turn. And yes, it's going to have something to do with plot. But there's a, there's a sort of game uh, going on there. And then we have this game between the uh, the Bragadino of um, well, after you, after you talk, and then interrupting, and that game goes on for a while, and uh, and they sort of, um, and I don't even want to contemplate uh, uh, the the woman's concavity, um, uh, the, the, the 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 what they're actually discussing there, as opposed to what the innuendo is, and and how that that functions. Uh, anyone else wants to di dip into that one? Feel free to. Uh, 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 expand or or not other thoughts before we move on to the next scene uh aliki i think i can expand on that concavity <laughs> i think it's to do with being accommodating in in the more general sense in the more um emotional sense you know um yeah i'm not mm -hmm. going to go any further than that i i, I think you know just being being nice and bowing and smiling and accommodating. Mm. Uh, Lynn, I I would have to disagree. Um, in a, another early modern play, get your duck call. Um, uh, concavity is another way of saying hollowness, which is another way of saying f falseness, unreliability. So maybe a, a hollow lover or or. A, a false lover so concave means hollow which means false I, that that's the non-pornographic um <laughs> metaphor that's that's being that's that's my guess i don't think that the text supports that in this case unless we are to believe that the spaniard is misusing english idiom which quite possibly he is mm. um Okay, other thoughts about the scene uh, or other things before we move forward? Okay, let's go into scene three. Uh, we have uh, a fair number of people coming in, uh, who one of which we've met before, uh, one of whom has been on stage before, but we haven't really met, and some other people. So enter the Queen, uh, uh, Gile, uh, Ianthe, uh, uh, there's a Herald, Eurybates, and Clearchus with a picture. My queen? Uh, mm -hmm. Greg. Greg. Yeah. Speaks before the Herald. Okay. Alright, so uh, I lost track. I'm lost. Oh yeah, sorry. I was in scene four, which didn't help. Um, advance that picture on this fatal spring, and herald speak, uttering the king's edict. Ptolemy, the most sacred king of Egypt, first of that name, desiring peace and amity with his neighbor princes, hath caused this picture of Cleanthes to be set up in all places proposing great rewards to him that finds him and threatening death to him that suckers him. It's forbidden put it in his mind, yet not to so to... Yeah. Which God's forbidden put it in his mind, not to so to stomach his unjust exile, that he convert the fury of his arm against forsaken Egypt, taking part with these four neighbour kings that threaten him and have besieged his most imperial town. Now may it please your highness to leave your discontented passions and take this morning's pride to hunt the boar. We have attended on your grace thus far out of the city, being glad to hear your highness had abandoned discontent and now will bend yourself to merriment. So will I, lovely young say, come then. Let us go for, call forth sacred Isis's nymphs to help us keep the game in ceaseless view. That to the heaven, so that to the busy brightness of his eyes we may so intervent his shifts to escape that giddy with his turning he may fall, slain with our beauties more than our swords or darts. And then sit the queen with attendants with a sound of horns. Uh, uh. <laughs> Enter Leon 
Leon uh, with his sword. Now am I Leon, the rich usurer, and here according to the king's command and mine own promise, I have brought my sword and fix it by the statues she set up. By this am I known to be Cleanthes, whose sudden sight I now will take upon me and cause the nobles to pursue my shadow. As for my substance, they shall never find till I myself do bring myself to light. Cleanthes! Cleanthes, stop Cleanthes, see Cleanthes, pursue Cleanthes, follow Cleanthes. Uh, enter three lords with swords drawn. Where is Cleanthes? Leon, sawest thou him? I? why should I else have cried thus out on him? I saw him even now. Here did he fix his sword, and not for dastard fear or cowardice, for all, no know all Egypt rings of his renown, but fearing for his noble service done to be rewarded with ingratitude, he fled from hence, fearing to be pursued. Come on, my lords, then we'll follow him and pursue him to the death. And exit the lords. Oh, do not hurt him, gentle citizens. See how they fly from him whom they pursue. <laughs> I am Cleanthes. And whilst I am here, in vain, they follow for to find him out. But here comes my love, bright Samathis, my love equally with fair Elimini. See, here she comes, as I appointed her. Enter Samathis with her maids, with a banquet, including Draqueen, Draquine. But if faith, mistress, is this for a wooer? Not for a wooer only, my dear queen, but a quick speeder girl, for uh, this is he that all my fortunes runs upon, I tell thee. Oh, thank you, mistress. Send for some more banquet. No, my fine wench. This and myself is well, and let him not sit down like the ox and the ass, but give God thanks, for we are worthy of it, though we say it. Mistress, tis true, and that he may be good. I conjure him by these three things across. Now let him come, he shall be good, I warrant ye. Nay, do not fly me, gentle Samathis. Pardon me, sir, for if I see a man, I shall so blush still that I warrant you I could make white wine claret with my looks. But do not blush and fly an old man's sight. From whom, if not from old men, should I fly? <clears throat> From young men, rather, that can swift pursue, and then it is some credit to outgo them. Yet, though my years would have me old, I am not, but have the gentle jerk of youth in me as fresh as he that hath a maiden's chin. Thus can I bend the stiffness of my limbs, thus can I turn and leap and hoise my gait, thus can I lift my love as light as air. Now say, my Samathis, am I old or young i would have my love neither old nor young but in the middle just between them both fit am i then for matchless samathis and will be bold to sit for bachelors must not be shamefast when they meet with maids sweet love now let me entreat you sit and welcome you to your own banquet here even thus did iris say that he should say mm. then by your leave, sir, I will sit with you. Welcome as gold into my treasury. And now will I drink unto my love with the same mind that drinking first began to one another. And what was that, I pray, sir? I'll tell my love the first kind cause of it, and why it is used as kindness still among us, if it be used aright. Tis to this end, when I do say, I drink this love to you, I mean I drink this to your proper good, as if I said, what health this wine doth work in me shall be employed for you, at your command and to your proper use. And this was the first intent of drinking to you. It is very pretty, is it not, Jacqueline? Oh, excellent, mistress. He's a dainty man. Mm. Now to your use, sweet love, I drink this wine, and with a merry heart that makes long life over the cup I'll sing for my love's sake. 
And here there is a song. Health, fortune, mirth, and wine, no to thee, my love divine. I drink to my darling, give me thy hand, sweeting, with cup full ever plied, and hearts full ever plied, and hearts full never dried. Mine own, mine own, dearest sweeting, oh, oh, mine own, dearest sweeting, what frolic love, mirth makes the banquet sweet. I love it, sir, as well as you love me. That is as well as I do love myself. I will not joy my treasure, but in thee and in thy looks I'll count it every hour, and thy white arms shall be as bonds to me, wherein our mighty lordships forfeited, and all the dames of Alexandria for their attire shall take their light from thee. Well, sir, I drink to you, and pray you think you are as welcome to me as this wine. Thanks, gentle Samothis, but delicious love hath been the fig I eat before this wine, which kills the taste of these delicious cates. Will you bestow that banquet love on me? Nay, gentle Leon, talk no more of love. If you love God or a good countenance, for I shall be quite for I shall quite be out of countenance then. Love decks the countenance spiriteth the eye, and tunes the soul in sweetest harmony. Love then, sweet Samothis. I, what shall I do, Jaqueen? Take the mistress, take him. Oh, but he hath a great nose. It is no matter for his nose, for he is rich. Leon, I love, and since tis forth, farewell. <laughs> Then triumph, Leon, richer in thy love than all the heaps of treasures I possess. Never was happy Leon rich before, nor ever was I covetous till now, till I see gold so fined in thy hair. Impart it to my parents, gentle Leon, and till we meet again at home, farewell. Exuant Samophis and maids leaving Leon. Soon will I talk with them and follow thee. So now is my desire accomplished. Now was there ever man so fortunate to have his love so sorted to his wish? The joys of many I in one enjoy. Now do I mean to woo them crossly, both. The one, as I am Leon, the rich usurer. The other, as I am the mad-brained count. Which, if it take effect and rightly prove, will be a sport for any emperor's love. And... Exit and you know, as as it goes on, you just feel the 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 morals uh, that 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 just just sort of leaking out of his ear there, just 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 bit bit by bit. Um, yes, um, Samophis, uh preferences there are very much Goldilocks of uh, of partners uh, uh, in life. Uh, you look for someone who's neither old nor young, but in the middle, uh, um, just right. Um, yeah, there's some. Um, some 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 uh, additional problematic material in the sense that uh, Leon's disguise as a usurer is uh, is now we've got additional details that he's uh, it seems to be following an anti-Semitic trope there of having a big nose. Um, so that seems that they're they're playing uh, uh, that card uh, in the and possibly that's part of the performance uh, idea of the part as well. Uh, thoughts from the room uh, about this this game that is being played here um, as we go on. Um, Helen. It's difficult to tell how this is going to end up well, unless our blind beggar hero actually gets into serious trouble. Well, I, I, I don't want to do any spoilers. Uh, and, and, and so um, I'm saying nothing. I'm saying nothing at all. Um, then I won't ask. Indeed, indeed. Um, it, it, uh, it, yeah, interesting things are happening. This play has directions. Alexandra. Depending on what it's intended to do, it mm. might be. Again, I have not. I have not read the rest, so this might be going very, very wrong. But yes, Helen, one way is for things to go very far south for him, and the other one is that it ends up sort of 
uh, in that kind of madcap comedy where how does he manage to juggle everything and still end up on top in the end and all the plots work out perfectly or don't, but he still somehow Houdini's his way out of it. Um, it, it depends on how much... It's yeah, bigger, me. Y- yes, which is can't... hilarious! You can't Houdini your way out of bigamy. I think I, I, I can think of the odd sitcom which has uh, attempted to do just that, um, yeah. <laughs> to greater or lesser extent. Uh, in fact, lots of uh, lots of things have tried to do that. Um, other thoughts, Sarah, muted at the moment. Yeah, I can just imagine a situation going back to the conversation myself and Alexandra were having earlier, where he just kills himself off. Over yeah. and over. Um, and fakes his own death. Yeah, to, to the point where he's no longer committing bigamy. But I mean, I don't know. That's just, I, I, I have no idea where it's going, to be honest. So that's just kind of a fairly clueless comment, really. Mm. <laughs> but it's going to be complicated because it's not just he's pretending to be Leon, he's pretending to be a count. He's also going to pretend to be the object of the queen's affection, Cleanthes, I guess. So that's like, he wants to get it on with three different women. And so he's really gonna have to do some tap dancing to get himself out of that. Mm. Well, four, if, if remember the th- uh, three maids visited him as well. So we can assume that- One of them's mine. Mm. One, of them's, one of them's Pegos. Okay, he's gonna okay. Get you, you, he's you, gonna- think that's the, you think that's how it's gonna go down? You know, well, you, you, we've met this guy. You know. <laughs> but he's not that keen on that one. Yeah. Uh, other thoughts before we go into our final scene of the session? No, lovely. Okay, let's go to scene four. Uh, we, we, I think we've had a name check earlier, but I don't think we've actually seen. Uh, enter Ptolemy. Uh, 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 Gile, uh, Doricles, Aspasia, Ianthe, uh, Euro, uh, Euro who I hope doesn't say anything because, um, I've not given the part out, Clearchus and Eurybates with sound. So make sure you're unmuted. Prince of Arcadia, lovely Doricles, be not discouraged that my daughter here like a well-fortified and lofty tower, is so repulsive and unapt to yield the royal siege of your heroic part, in her achievement will be more renowned, and with the greater merit is employed. The beauteous queen, my wife, her mother here, was so well manned, and yet, and yet had never man so made a rock of chaste and cold disdain. My lord, what mean you? Uh, go, Aspasia, send for some ladies to go play with you at chess, uh, at billiards, and at other games. Yance, attend her. You take a course, my lord, to make her coy, to urge so much the love of Doricles and fame, frame a virtue of her wanton hate. We must persuade her that he loves her not. That his services and vows of love about the gentle compliments of court. So would she think that if, sorry, so would she think that if she would have loved, she might have won him with that conceit of hardness to be won, his merit's grace will shine more clearly in her turning eyes. Things hard to win with ease makes life in love incited and favors won with ease are hardly quitted. Then make as if you loved her not, my lord. Love that has built his temple on my brows, out of his battlements into my heart, and seeing me burn in my desire will be, I hope, appeased at the last. Ruled by me, and I warrant you, she quickly shall believe you love her not. What shall I do, madam? Look not on her so much i cannot choose my neck stands never right till it be turned aside and i behold her now trust me a wry necked love was never seen but come with me my lord and i'll instruct you better so madam i leave you 
Now from our love sports to Antisthenes and his great suit with Leon. Enter Antisthenes, Leon, and uh, Pego as the Burgomaster. Uh, see the Burgomaster, Antisthenes and Leon come together. Stay, Master Burgomaster. What reason made you use your office on the Lord Antisthenes, seizing on all his movables and goods at the suit of Leon? I will tell your grace the reason of it or anything else. For I know you are a wise prince and apt to learn. I thank you for your good opinion, sir. But the reason of your office done upon this nobleman and his lands? The reason why I have put in office or execution my authority upon this nobleman consisteth in the three principal points or members, which indeed are three goodly matters. I pray you, let's hear them. First, is the credit of this honest man because he is rich. Why is he honest because he is rich? Oh, I learned that in any case. The next is the forfeit of his assurance. And the last, I will not trouble your grace with all. But this is it whereof I must complain unto your grace, that having occasion in your grace's service to borrow money of this Leon here, for which I mortgaged all my lands and goods, he only did agree that paying him four thousand pound at the day I should receive my statute safely in, which now not only falsely he denies, but that he hath received one penny due, which this my friend can witness I repaid upon the stone of Eris, the blind man, four thousand pound in jewels and in gold, and therefore crave I justice in this case. Vouchsafe, dread sovereign, an unpartial ear to that I have to say for my reply. He pleads the payment of four thousand pound upon the stone behind Blind Iris Cave, to which I answer, and do swear by heaven, he spake with me at the aforesaid place and promised payment of four thousand pound, and I would let him have his statutes in and take other assurance for another thousand, some three months to come or thereabouts, which I refusing, he repaid me none, but parted in a rage, and cared not for me. Ah, oh, monstrous, who ever heard the like? My lord, I will be sworn, he paid him on poor Iris Stone four thousand pounds, which I did help to tender, and hast thou a hellish conscience, and such a brazen forehead to deny it against my witness and his noble word? Sir, against your witness and his noble word, I plead mine own and one as good as his, that then was present at our whole conference. My lord, there was not any but ourselves. But who was it that thou affirmst was there? Count Hermes, good my lord, a man well known, though he be humorous, do be honourable. And will he say it? He will, my gracious lord, I am well assured, and him will I send hither presently, entreating your gracious favour if the impediment of a late sickness cause me not return, for I am passing ill. Well, send him hither, and it shall suffice. I will, my gracious lord, and stand to any censure, passing willingly, your highness shall set down or command, worshipful Master Burgomaster, your officer, to see performed betwixt us. And exit Leon, Pego, take your time, there's a quick change here. Ah, uh, we thank you heartily. Alas, poor soul, how sick he is. <laughs> no, truly I cannot choose but pity him in that he loves your gracious officers. Enter Count Hermes. Oh, I thank you, sir. King, by your leave, and yet I need not ask leave because I'm sent for. If not, I'll be gone again <laughs> without leave. Say, am I sent for, yea or no? You are to witness twixt Antisthenes and wealthy Leon. I know the matter, and come from that old miser Leon, who is suddenly fallen sick of a knave's evil. Uh, which of you are troubled with that disease, masters? Well, say what you know of the matter betwixt them. But then, thus I say, my lord Antisthenes came to the stone of the blind fool Iris that day when four thousand pounds were to be paid 
where he made proffer of so much money if Leon would return the mortgage of his lands and take assurance for another thousand to be paid, I trow some three months to come or hereabout, which Leon, like an old churl as he was, most uncourteously refused. My lord Antisthenes, as he might very well, departed in a rage. But if it had been to me, I, I would have pistoled him, faith. But you are wondrously deceived, my lord, and was not by when he and we did talk. Swoons, then I say you are deceived, my lord, for I was by. Now, by my honour and by all the gods. Then you stood close, my lord, unseen to any. Why, I stood close to you, and seen of all, and if you think I am too mad a fellow to witness such a way piece of work, the holy beggar shall perform as much, for he was by at our whole conference. But say, Count Hermes, was the beggar by? I say he was, and he shall say he was. But he is now, they say, locked in his cave, fasting and praying, talking with the gods, and hath an iron door twixt him and you. How win you then come at him? I'll fetch him from his cave in spite of all his gods and iron doors, or beat him blind when I do catch him next. Farewell, my lords, you have done with me. I'll send the beggar presently, for I am riding now to Coracus. And exit the count. Uh, take your time, Ptolemy. Another quick change. I know not what to think in these affairs. I cannot well condemn you, my lord, and your sufficient witness being a gentleman, nor yet the other two, both men of credit, though in his kind this count be humorous. But stay, we shall hear straight what Iris will depose. Enter Iris. Oh, who disturbs me in my holy prayers? Oh, that the king were by, that he might hear what thundering there is at my farther door. Oh, how the good of Egypt is disturbed in my devotion. I'm here, Iris. And it was Count Hermes that was so rude to interrupt thy prayers. But I suppose the end of thy repair, being so weighty, he could not have displeased. For on my witness doth depend the living of Lord Antisthenes, who doth affirm that three days past he tendered at thy stone four thousand pounds to Leon and desired his mortgage quitted, which he promising on such assurance more as he proposed, received at that time his four thousand pounds. I then was in the hearing of them both, but heard no penny tendered, only proposed by Lord Antisthenes if he would bring him in his mortgage and take assurance for another thousand some three months to come or thereabouts which leon most uncourteously refused M my lord was angry and i heard no more and thus i must crave pardon of your grace and exit iris farewell grave iris gods are become oppressors of the right never had right so violent a wrong for let the thunder strike me into hell if what i have reported be not true this holy man no doubt speaks what he heard and i am sorry for antisthenes but i'll relieve your low estates my lord and for your service done me good in you master burgomaster let the lord have liberty and i will answer leon what is due and exit so we have the game for this scene which is um oh oh i've got a witness hang on um oh i'm a bit sick <laughs> oh um oh i've got a witness too there's another witness i'll uh, we'll get him i've got to ride off now on a horse so you won't see me again uh you kind of feel that maybe they could have played this game further <laughs> it's like hang on could we just clarify something that uh the count said earlier yes hang on <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, a, a relatively clear game um, and someone who's going to lose a lot of money um, in, in probably not desperately fair circumstances. Um, I mean, it, it looks like Ptolemy is going to, you know, cover everything. But even so, it's um, this guy doing doing all sorts of shenanigans here. Uh, thoughts on the room? Uh, Lynn. 
I gotta wonder how those quick changes were accomplished, you know, 400 years before Velcro was invented. <laughs> like, how, how, whoa, I, I'm impressed. And boy, am I curious how they did them because that those are ridiculously fast. Mm, yeah, I mean, uh, Pega, we've got three lines and one of them's not even a full line. I mean, uh, four lines, uh, one of them's not even a full, it's three and a half lines. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, Rachel? Oh. I wonder if the actor is wearing um, uh, maybe one or two uh, suits of clothing at once, or uh, I, you know, uh, so it, the physicality of the characters would wind up changing, uh, you know, in doing that. You know, somebody could be a little more svelte or portly than depending how many of these clothing they're taking off. I know it takes a while to put them on and off, but um, uh, you know, it, it, instead of putting on a, a completely different outfit, it's yeah. just the removal of one and, and keeping whatever its place in backstage. And he's always wearing at least one of these personas underneath another or something. Yeah. I don't know how you would still do it with the amount of characters he's changing, but mm. maybe it would speed it up some. Uh, Sarah, then Aliki. Yeah, I mean, I. Lynn, I'd have thought you'd know more about this than, than I do, but I know I, I once saw a ballet um, where a character did, did a quick change on stage. Um, and and they, I, I, I don't even know how they did it because it was like, it was so fast. Um, it was almost like slate of hand, but they literally, they sort of, they un untied something from the front and then let it fall down and then they suddenly were they were in a completely different outfit it was cinderella actually it was uh it was when the fairy godmother transforms her from her rags into a princess outfit and i do not know how they do it but she did it in front of everybody and it just it just happened she just yeah. released something on the top and it all felt so and i'm wondering because he did the quick change actually in front of the audience earlier um maybe that was actually a part of it you know maybe that was actually a part of the show the fact that he could do this clever mm -hmm. thing with a double sided costume and mm -hmm. and turn from one character to another it might be a thing that that the audience go oh you know so i mean maybe he doesn't even i mean he obviously goes off stage in terms of the the um that the characters the other characters can't see him but it could be actually a thing that that this production became known for you know where, where where they do this incredibly clever very quick change and you know maybe that's partly what the audience were going to to, to see mm. uh and whether uh, other actors who are not on stage are, are there to facilitate quick changes as well that you know who basically the actor just steps off stage and then they are grabbed uh, i mean i've seen effectively instantaneous costume changes uh in, in number of productions i mean it's it's, it's always you know where someone can step off stage in what looks to be an incredibly complicated outfit and then they're sh literally you know one two and they're back on again somehow it's done so i, I think it's got to be something that they think about and that we get little details we know that uh the count for example you know velvet riding gown there's a patch there's stuff um you know we're getting little hints at how some of this might work i wonder whether there's mask as well you know whether there's or something that's effectively that can just go thump. Uh, a half mask or something. Uh, I, I don't know. That's entirely, there's no evidence for that at all, but I just, maybe that's a way of doing some of these characters. Mm. Uh, just for clarity and speed. Aliki, I think you were waving earlier. Yeah, I don't think I have anything to add, really, to, to that discussion. I think, yeah, the the velvet eye patch, the the gown, presumably a hermity kind of overcoat for uh, Iris. I, mm. I think it could be done quite easily and fun mm. and of course we can work in the assumption that whoever's pego and you know uh knows to vamp there yeah. um you know you know oh sick he is how i haven't told you how sick he is he's so sick um etc 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 um until you know enter count thank you very much for coming on um <laughs> in your own time um yeah uh so yeah, it's 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 another swindle. It's another de demonstration of his cleverness. 
um, you know, uh, how far does the play sustain this kind of business? Um, or can it sustain, uh, you know, and again, looking to our modern uh, eyes of, of, you know, he's not a desperately sympathetic chap. Um, in his actions, whereas, of course, the player is pushing us, going, look how clever this guy is. <laughs> he could do any... I mean, I don't know how the play ends, so we can't fully, as ever, at this stage, predict. But, you know, if we say this is the interval, um, you know, uh, who, who's, who's coming back with an axe? Um, <laughs> um, uh, and, and things, so... Um, but we do have some uh, some lovely scenes and lovely setups that are going on there and some nicely drawn people along the way and some some really interesting lines uh, and some really interesting dialogue uh so yeah uh, any any uh any thoughts on where 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 we're going with this as it were uh alexandra um i found that um the entire argument of um what actually happened with this mortgage and this money is is constructed in order to be intentionally obfuscating mm. um which is great the trouble is i don't know how that would work for a modern audience how much we would if we're not sympathizing with this person because he's doing things that that are morally reprehensible nowadays um and so he'd ha he'd either have to persuade us to sympathize with him for the fun um or for the cleverness and so with an with a situation like this where the um the obfuscation is very clever but it's difficult to follow at least nowadays um i i wonder how that would work in a in a modern production i don't think the costume changes would be would be as difficult as the um the character um, um not dynamics but the yes the the sort of us understanding and agreeing to go along with the character on this journey and then not falling off that journey if that hmm. makes sense i mean to be fair to the early modern uh people uh who might have watched this or were doing it the, these things were all morally reprehensible then um you know we we uh, so it's, I mean, I'm thinking to, you know, uh, modern day things where there's a con going on. This is just a long con uh, or a series of cons. Um, and, you know, the, the enjoyment one gets out of that. Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, I mean, it partly depends on how it ends. This is, this is as ever, our problem. How does the play end? <laughs> uh, Alexandra again. It, just to clarify, um, it's not what I meant was not that, you know, we might we might consider these to be bad things to do. It's that in our modern society, um, as of especially the last few years, um, things like deceiving a young woman into sex um, have have become subjects of conversation and are viewed in ways that no longer make uh, the the same impact that they would have, you know, 30 years ago. Mm. So carry on comedy is to a lot of people no longer funny because of the subject matter. And that's what I'm worrying about here. Mm. Uh, yes, uh, ultimately context changes meaning and uh, and the meaning of the play changes. Uh, but that doesn't mean we might have a totally different play that might um, might land in a totally different way that might still work. Um, there might be still interesting things to come out of this. Um, Sarah? Yes, uh, following on from that conversation, I mean, you, you still get a lot of, yeah, long con or short con um, stories these days and they are incredibly popular um but they tend to be around money um they don't tend to be around sex and sexual politics the way they perhaps once were and i, and I can see how this um this plot like is supposed to work on that level like you find the con entertaining you know but I actually, I kind of agree with Alexandra. I'm not entirely sure that the audience, that a, a contemporary audience would be, I mean, some of them would be comfortable with it, but I can imagine a lot of them not being comfortable with it the way they would be if the con was about, say, money, um, just because of the, you know, the, the, the era that we live in, the, the sexual politics of the era. However, I mean, I don't, yeah, it is a worry, but I'm, I'm, 
I'm going to be really interested to see what happens. I mean, I always am with these plays. I'm always, especially the comedies, I'm always interested to see what they think of is a good ending uh, and whether it whether it tallies up with what I think of as a good ending because sometimes it does and sometimes it really, really doesn't. Um, so, it, you know, it could go either way. But it is a, it is an interesting point to, to, to like have in the back of your mind because what, what was entertaining then isn't necessarily entertaining now, you know. Mm. I mean, you know, we band, bandy words like comedy about. Uh, you did, did, going back to the description, uh, most pleasantly, uh, the blind beggar, uh, most pleasantly discoursing his variable humours in disguised shapes, full of conceit and pleasure. So it seems to be the the uh, one of the big things here is its conceits, its its cleverness um, of of the action seems to be one. Uh, I mean, it's always difficult to tell because, for all we know, that's just the publisher <laughs> verb. Um, you know, someone uh, you know put together to sell the, the play script regardless of whether it actually has any connection with the play um, you've always been a bit debatable about that but um, uh, it may be a survival from you know uh, the original advertising for the production I mean that's the, that's one of the, the, the big questions about playbills and of the time because uh, we don't have any uh, that survive sadly um, uh, any other thoughts about the specifically the close that closing scene that we've just done? Um, Ptolemy seems seems fine. You know, willing to sort of go. Well, I'm really sorry about this, but you know, it does seem like it's a slam dunk case. Lots of witnesses, you know, but I'll uh, I'll cover you. I'll cover you. That seems nice. Um... So, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. It's an odd thing to do, because either right is on one side or on the other. And Ptolemy is effectively saying, I think you're probably in the right, therefore I'll cover you. Despite the fact that all the evidence points the other way. Mm. I mean, he, 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 it is a very strange thing to do. Mm. And it's, in fact, the only thing that makes the blind beggar's ruse palatable to the audience, I would have thought, that the guy isn't getting hurt by it. Mm. Yes. Um, maybe Ptolemy can hear the, 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 the audience's hysterical laughter, you know, just, just through, the, through the fourth wall. He can hear it and it's just going, oh, hang on, hang on, there's something funny going on here. Um... Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe Iris isn't as good an actor as he thinks he is, uh, you know, debate, you know. I, I'm sure that with the right actor, this thing could be very funny and could be very well carried off. But as we're reading it now, it's got so many plot and moral holes in it that I'm finding it quite difficult. Fair enough. Uh, okay, we're going to go around the room for final thoughts. Um, they can intersect with any anything we've got uh, going so far. Uh, you also are entirely free not to have any final thoughts and just wave us on. Uh, Rachel, you're waving anyway. Uh, do you want to incorporate uh, whatever you were going to say uh, and additional thoughts uh, there thereabout? Um... Uh... Uh, my my thing that I was going to say for the last scene was um, uh, Leon, Iris, whatever his name is, that he's got so many names, I'm so confused. Uh, he just came into like 4,000 pounds all at once. That's a lot of money uh, by having this king do this split decision um, that he didn't have before or now he has. Or, yes, he did because he was paid. So now he's got 8,000 pounds for this. Anyway, um, so maybe that'll be a plot point tomorrow. Uh, um, I don't really like his character. Uh, and maybe that's just, uh, I, I mean, I don't know if he's specifically made to be likable, but um, uh, I, I don't know. There's, I have to see how it ends because this uh, kind of uh, character archetype I think we've seen a little bit in other plays. Uh, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I, I have no conclusions. I have no thoughts. Hmm. 
uh, Sarah, any final thoughts? Um, yeah, no, only really what I've heard, what I just said. I'm, I'm, I want to see how it how it turns out. I, in general, I do really like clever plays. I, I, you know, I, I have a bit of a soft spot for a for a heist film, or a or a or a con uh, drama, but just because they tend to have really clever um, plots um, and. Yeah, I find them entertaining. So I'm I'm going to be interesting to see interested to see how this turns out. Whether I actually do find it entertaining, or whether I find it like creepy and offensive, it could it could go either way at, at, at the moment. I, I think it's it's kind of looking a bit creepy and offensive, but I'm 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 willing to um, uh, suspend you know my judgment till I get to the end of the play. Uh, Lynn, any final thoughts? Yes, I kind of on the same page with almost everybody who's spoken so far that this is, yeah, this is intriguing, but a little troubling. I cannot stop thinking about Volpone and the Alchemist um, because the, the main characters in those plays remind me so much of Eros. Um, and, um, but the difference is uh, that in Volpone, the um, the title character is is a big faker and um, and a great actor and a great manipulator. But what he wants is money, and his and his little sidekick along with him. And they're and they're conning people who are even more reprehensible than he is. So we don't really feel too bad about it. And then he decides to use his his powers of deception to coerce a young woman that he finds desirable into sleeping with him. And I think he loses us as an audience. Uh, and then he does get his comeuppance in the end. Volpone ends up in the galleys. Um, so I, I find it was even more troubling because he's getting money out of this poor guy who's already paid him. But his main goal seems to be to, to have sexual access to three different women who think he's someone he's not and that's well, that's really that's really uncomfortable that's really troubling i'm I, i'm interested to see but uh, how the play manages to rationalize that or justify that or or create a soft landing for that and i am skeptical that it can be done hmm. yeah it's uh, it's a it's the way it opens as well um, with this sort of backstory thing about this absent duke and what happened there. And I'm not really sure, actually, we're quite clear as to what was happening with this other personality he was affecting at the time that we listened to when he's talking to the Queen and, and how all that works, as well as set up uh, to what goes on later. Um, it, it, it feels like we've landed in the middle. Or it's, I, I felt like we were sort of going, did we miss something? Was there a was there a scene um, and it's deliberate um, and it reminds me of something very specific that I'll uh, I'll throw in at the end. Um, Greg, any final thoughts? Looking forward. To, well, I saw sort of, I I've got a vague memory of what happens. So um, yeah, no, really interesting play. Really interesting hearing it out loud. When you're reading it on page, it's really difficult to sort of find the way through, but it's it's much more interesting on page. Uh, Emma, any final thoughts? Um, yeah, it also, um, that's what I was going to say, actually. It also reminded me of, of, of Bob Boney. Um Yeah, I'm enjoying, like, the, the cleverness and the comedy of it. Um, but, yeah, it is, it is problematic. And I really hope that finishing the play tomorrow will give a, a satisfying resolution like will give us a way out of this that's um that's acceptable um and also i think um iris never actually specifically says oh by the way i'm pretending to be blind but we kind of have to infer that because obviously his other characters aren't blind so there's a whole other irony there of using this i'm pretending to be pretending to be blind but i can see so that's a whole kind of other element to it as well um i enjoy playing bragadino uh, I'd like to have another crack at it. Now I know kind of what the comedy setup is and how that's supposed to work. Um, but yeah, that was fun. I'd, I'd, I'd say you get another chance, but it, it, a one-hit wonder, we will not see his like again. Um, 
uh helen any final thoughts uh i think you've really had mine i i'm uh, i don't know what i don't know what i think about this play really it it i i i like to think that it's got some merit in it um but i've yet to discover what that is um... except i like the little girls hmm Yes, I, I thought they I, were. I thought they were very well observed. Yeah, I, I, I think that that that's the thing is that it's it's the sort of situation and the 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 central premise, but actually a lot of the drawing of the actual individual characters as they go is working quite well. Mm, um, mm, and mm, uh, mm. say it, 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 it's it's got some nice nice turns of phrases and 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 and, and the fact that each scene has effectively a game that you can play uh, makes it very playable. It's just it's the overarching problem that's the problem. Uh, mm. So far, we shall see. Uh, Aliki, final thoughts. You're done. Uh, uh, Alexandra, any final thoughts? Yes, just the one that you've just uttered. Um, I too think that it is structurally very good. Um, I think that uh, the the problems that we have are to do with our kind of modern perception of the subject matters. Um, but I'm sure that in its time, it would have been a, a massive hit or it would have had potential for, for one. Um, there's, it's not just the sexual politics. There's things like the anti-Semitism and the ableism and all these other things that if you wanted to put it on as a modern production, you would have to, to deal with and find reasoning for each of them. So I think that would be very difficult to do nowadays um, in, in, and put this on in a way that does not court controversy and just kind of um, in, lets us enjoy the structure and the construction of it, which I do think are, are, are very good, at least so far. We have historically on this program um, had a um, a lot of instances of things that get set up really well and then don't end up um, delivering on those setups. So I really, really hope that that's not the case. Um, but yes, I think the fact that most of us have said we're interested, we don't necessarily like what this, what's going on, but we're interested, I think speaks to uh, the skill of the writer. That even though we're very disturbed by the subject matter. We're still going, yeah, but the, the way you've constructed this story, man. Mm. Mm. The, yeah. Uh, so, um, I, I, it, it's, it's that interesting question about uh, the, this kind of central figure, this kind of central, quite showy figure in the, mi the middle of the action, where it, it, it reminds me of sort of the problems with uh, something like Sherlock, um, where you have this uh, central figure who's very, very clever, and, um, and it's just the smugness levels that I, I, I worry about with a character like this. You've got to like them. They've not got to be too smug. Um, you know, this is on top of all the, the other uh, issues uh, laid around it. But also that, you know, it's, it's, it, it's something that declares it's interested in, it, in its conceits and its pleasures, that I wonder whether it's actually more interested in, in these effects and these scenes than actually having a coherent plot that will all hold together at the end. I worry that the, the writer is perhaps more interested in, uh, in uh, uh, the same way that opening scene uh, plays with our expectations um, because of, uh, you know, uh, who is who and who is, are they at that point and who knows who they are at that point. And then it's like, oh, hang on, you're that guy. Oh, hang on. Oh, yeah. And it's like you've just um, th thrown thrown us in uh, in a way that's again for effect. I wonder about that. Um, Helen. Yeah, I just realised what's missing. It's the element of peril. Mm. Here you've got this guy playing a long con. In fact, many long cons simultaneously. And you never, he never trips for an instant. There's never a moment when you say... He's about to be caught, and then he isn't. Mm. And I think that is that that would make a difference if there was some peril. Mm. I think that, that's a very good point. That he's strolling through this, isn't he? He's mm. just strolling. It's a saunter, which, which is not a, nearly as interesting as if he was uh, had problems. Mm. Well, it's that thing about fast, fast functions in 
part uh this isn't a farce but um you know it functions because the person is desperately running from one thing to another thing to another thing whereas this guy's sauntering from one disguise to another and he um, never needs to say you're only supposed to blow the bloody door off mm. what <laughs> Sorry, the Italian job. Mm. Uh, uh, oh, uh, 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 a popular British film. Mm. Oh. Uh, anyway, on that note, um, <laughs> we will close this session. We have one more session. It's not a long play. Uh, we only have one more session on The Blind Beggar of Alexandria. Uh, we will have better uh, answers, hopefully, as to uh, what to do with this next time. All that remains is thank all the wonderful readers for their wonderful reading. Thank you very much. And goodbye. Such lifeless puppies. <laughs> <laughs>